Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are and whenever you are. A little bit out of order today. Chuck Tomasi, I am the ServiceNow guy with the cool bow tie, doing the purple thing today. Purple and lavender, to be accurate. This is Thursday, August 23rd. Yes, I had to think. I'm, I'm ready to go. Got my cup of herbal tea ready here. And uh, just wanted to let you know that next week I will only be doing three episodes, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. Normally I do this every weekday, Monday through Friday, when personal life and work life don't interfere. Well, personal life is interfering. I am taking a personal trip, going to Dragon Con in Atlanta, Georgia, for a big nerd fest. If you're going to be there, I look forward to seeing you. We've got a couple of live podcasts. We've got a couple of things. Let's see if we can arrange a meetup when we're there. I'd love to say hi. I'd love to exchange, maybe have a beverage or two. Uh, just let me know if you are going to Dragon Con in Atlanta, Georgia. It's a great time if you haven't been there. Movies, TVs, books, podcasting, robotic science. It's a nerd fest. Similar to Comic-Con, yet different. Big convention. So that's where I will be. So we won't have a Thursday and Friday show. And then Monday we are off for a U.S. holiday, Labor Day. But that's into September. Let's worry about now for now. That should be one of our slogans, right? We do this We do this show every day on YouTube, as I mentioned. You can subscribe at the URL below, get notifications. Good morning if you're joining us on YouTube. Give me a chat. Give me a shout out in the chat. Let me know where you're from. How's the weather? How are the kids? Some of you have been here for uh, the nine months that we've been doing this show, so <laughs> I appreciate it very, very much. You are amazing. We also simulcast this on Twitch. If that is your preference, you can go to the Twitch URL. There are some people that watch there. Thank you for that as well. And if you've got more than a quick shout out, a hello, a question for your peers in the chat, give uh, jump on over to the community, community.servicenow.com. It is a wonderful place. That's what we're here for is the community to answer questions, to move that process down the road, to discover, to learn, to share. That's what this is all about. So community.servicenow.com. If you start asking questions like, hey, I've got a performance analytics question. How do you do this breakdown? And if you do that in the chat, I can't answer it because no one's going to be able to find it later. YouTube and Twitch aren't a very good resource for Chuck asking that question. I'm sorry, I don't do show notes to that extent. What I will tell you is that uh, Tech Now episode 55, I just discovered this this morning, one brave young soul has gone and made a time index in the comments of episode 55. Uh, not on the community, but on YouTube. So you can jump directly to a piece of information about Flow Designer or Integration Hub or the Slack. All that stuff we talked about in London last week, it's been indexed. Thank you. That was amazing. If I had a, uh, a way to repay you, I would. So hopefully this counts for something. Good morning to India. We have India online. I hope you had a wonderful work day. That's why I start this broadcast out every day with good morning, good afternoon, good evening, because it's my morning, but it's your evening. It might even be your nighttime if we've got somebody from Australia. Thank you. Let me finish getting through the preliminaries and we will get to the community and a bunch of other cool stuff. If you are new to the community, I recommend checking out some of these guidelines. They're not hard and fast rules, but they work. Uh, make sure that you have one post per topic, one question. It goes in the right forum. Works out really well. And uh, provide context and background. You can read all about that. If you are an expert and you've been around the community for a while, then please share that information. Do like Stephen Bell did from uh, Accenture. He has posted part four of his series on Glide Record in the community. If you look for him, Stephen Bell, I believe it's SB. Uh, I'll find it for you. We'll, we'll search together for it in just a minute. Actually, why don't we do that right now? I'll jump back to where we are. Let me get to the screen here, and I am going to just type in Stephen Bell, Glide Record, and he's got a four-part series. This one is rather advanced. <laughs> so here's part two. He needs links from part one to part two to part three to part four. Here's part one, getting started, beginner walkthrough. Part four is advanced. He posted that yesterday. Good stuff. I mean, take a look at this. This is part one. And make sure I've got that at a reasonable, readable rate. Yep. And he starts out with doing some basic operations. And 
what he likes and what he doesn't like. He digs in and says, you know, these are some of the limitations. We're not afraid to hear some of that. It means that our developers have some opportunities to improve, right? Akash, good morning to you. Thank you, thank you. That's a good profile photo of the community. I, I think I took that last week. Might have been two weeks ago. Uh, I, I'm rebranding with the company, so I've got my green on green going. Today it's purple on purple. Uh, purple counts. So, yeah, check out Stephen Bell's uh, information over there on the community. If, where were we? We were on the developer page. Yes, go over to the developer portal, developer.servicenow.com. Get yourself a free personal developer instance, free learning plans, all the scripting APIs, lots of great information over there. You can learn, you can test, you can work on London. It's not publicly available for a few more days, but it is available on the personal developer instances. Take a look over there. I think you'll enjoy it. You can go watch the London video that we, show, the, that we showed and try out most of the stuff on that personal developer instance and uh, start exploring, learn what it's about. How is it going to upgrade? Maybe load a few of your update sets and find out if they are upgradable. How's that going for you? So go over to developer.servicenow.com. We also have meetups, developer meetups that I encourage you to check out. We've got one in Phoenix tonight. Somebody said, oh, I would really like to attend your Phoenix meetup, but I'm unable to fly across the Atlantic to see it. I appreciate that. Uh, it means they are interested. The topic I'm talking about in Phoenix tonight is all about integrating ServiceNow with Todoist. I talked a bit about that on Live Coding Happy Hour, another series that we do here at ServiceNow as part of the developer program. I also... Uh, did a few segments on it in this video series when I discovered uh, a use for name value pairs, for example, or how we handled locking. Some of those concepts the uh, I, I posted here, but the entire thing, the good news is, even if you can't make the meetup tonight, the entire thing is posted on the community. I did a blog entry in the developer portal about the ServiceNow Todoist integration. You know what? I'm going to show you that as well, just so you can find that. Get rid of the subtitle, get rid of the subtitle, go to the uh, iMac again, and in the search window, this time I'm clicking up here in the upper right corner, and type in Todoist, wrong keyboard. <laughs> Let's go back to this. <laughs> the fun of having two keyboards in front of me. It, it should be easier now because one is white and one is black. Todoist, do that. Fortunately, I have a monitor right up there that shows me what, what, what's going on. So it says, Lessons Learned Todoist to REST Integration. That's not the right title. It should be Todoist to ServiceNow Integration. I uh, am going to edit that right now. <laughs> that doesn't even make sense, Todoist to REST Integration. It's a Todoist REST Integration, but it's Todoist to ServiceNow. Okay. And it is a fairly long article, I will give you that. Somebody's already commented on it and said, hey, you know what? You could use this to generate GUIDs. Thanks, that's cool. So it basically covers uh, the background story of what I was integrating, the two different APIs that you can use for uh, Todoist, REST or Sync. What is a webhook? How do you implement it on Todoist? The uh, use of scripted REST APIs to receive that webhook information. A little bit about what I learned about the different versions of APIs. Sometimes the webhook is sending me version 6, sometimes it's sending version 8. And I need to, because the, the, the JSON payload is in a different format for each of those, you got to be able to parse that out and understand and say, oh, the date is in this format from this version, and the date is in a different format from a different version in a different place in the JSON payload. It gets crazy. So, yeah, versions matter. Pay attention to them. It took me several days to figure out why my date parsing on ServiceNow wasn't working because they kept throwing different information at me. Wasn't any fun. A uh, little bit about business rules and script actions. I've got a separate article about script actions on the blog. I wrote it six, seven years ago. Still valid. This goes into how I actually needed a requirement of one set and leveraged the other. Uh, there were some gaps, and I took advantage of that. Uh, how we did locking. There's a locking mechanism, or almost more of a semaphore to say, hey, this is in use, this is why I did this, and uh, if you see this incoming information, to stop a cyclical update. Because if I update something in ServiceNow, it's going to say, Todoist, you've got an update. Todoist sends back a webhook, and ServiceNow says, what do you want me to do with the webhook? Oh, you want me to update some information? And you could have a thing that goes around and around and around and around. We don't want that, so we have to put up some flags, some semaphores, some mechanism to say, 
this is what's happening and why. I also mentioned as a, uh, on this video series that I did the name value pairs as well. So goes into all of that in gory detail with code, with diagrams. I've got, I spared no expense. Let's just use the Jurassic Park reference there. Hello, Robert. Good to see you. Raul, welcome as well. So that's, uh, that's the meetups. Where were we? We were on the events. There are some events that I encourage you to check out at events. Excuse me, servicenow.com slash events.html. You can find them there. Follow me on LinkedIn or Twitter. Excuse me. Follow me on LinkedIn or Twitter for all that information. I post that on a daily basis, several posts a day, and it is typical. And we'll get James. Good to see you again. Hope things are well across the pond. Let's get moving on with uh, Tech Now episode 56 is coming up. You can find all of our Tech Now, Tech now episodes at the bit.ly link at the bottom. Episode 56 will be posted shortly. We're going to have a registration link coming up. I believe I fine-tuned that. Did I send that back? I gotta, there's, there's, the, the early parts of this episode are going on right now where I tell them, here's what we plan to do. And then we actually go and do it. So, uh, Craig Stepp will be leading that one all about extending Integration Hub with Custom Spoke. So if you haven't dealt with Flow Designer, if you haven't dealt with Integration Hub, uh, I recommend you go back and watch the videos that we did uh, December. I think it was 41, 42, somewhere in that area. Look at the link on the bottom. You can find it. It's all about Flow Designer and Integration Hub. We did two episodes in December. One of those was a whole bunch of Kingston features. The other was specifically about Integration Hub and Flow Designer. So you can get that. Steve is online. I think we're ready to go <laughs> as is a ServiceNow fan. If I do write any code today, it is available on our GitHub repo. You can find that there. I'm also going to include that link in the comments of this video when it's posted. So if you're not watching this live, look in the comments, or look in the, excuse me, in the description of this video and you should see that. You mean you might need to click that link that says show more. If you find something valuable in this video, be sure to click the like button so that others can uh, understand, hey, there's something valuable in here. Uh, a video that has maybe 22 likes is not as popular as a video that has 4,500 likes. I can dream, right? <laughs> 4,500. They go, wow, whatever was in there was gold. But hey, I appreciate it. If you think it's valuable, that's all you got to do. I'm not asking for any money here. <laughs> that would be my other podcast. Let's get started then with the community. Here we are at community.servicenow.com. I'm going to do a quick page refresh to get us started on that. And I like to start by clicking here on unreplied. I don't know if it does this or not. It does not. That's interesting, because when I shake the cursor on my screen, the cursor goes big. You just see a shaking cursor. <laughs> it's, a, it's a thing on the Mac, but interestingly enough, it doesn't transmit across the remote desktop. Huh. I gotta look into that. I don't know if that's a, a new thing that Telestream did for Wirecast and Desktop Presenter, but I swear it used to do that. Okay, gform dot get display box reference field dot value does not return values with ampersand. Whoa. That's interesting. Let's take a look at that. <clears throat> Can't say I have an answer for it. Sounds like it might be a potential bug. I'm using gform.getDisplayBox reference field dot value in a UI action as below. Function search community URL equals blah. Company equals blah. And for example, the reference field Apple and Pi, the URL search is just Apple. You, my friend, are, <clears throat> you need to encode that. And I don't know if there's a client-side way to do that. Um, actually, there might be. There might be. Let's sign on to the developer site. And I thought Glide URI had a client-side component to it that uh, we could do this with. So let's go to search Glide URI. I know there is a way to encode and instantiate a Glide URI object. You know what? Let's just do encode. Search. I don't like the search down there. Encode. It doesn't seem to be consistent. At least that's my experience and suspicion and superstition. Method encode JSON object Glide query condition. 
Community, where's the API? That's the API. 108 matches. Okay. Glide query condition, glide query condition, URL and code. That is a glide system class, which means it's going to happen on the server side. JSON, glide record, JSON. Do, 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 do. Let's do API client. That might get us a little closer. And is there anything about encoding in here? Clear the view to search all the APIs. Why is it not search? Encode. No matching results in Cabrillo. Why is my scrolling kind of stuck? <clears throat> and collapse. Get encoded query, get encoded query. Hmm. Well, the underlying problem is, the underlying problem is that ampersand is special to URLs. What you are actually telling it is another parameter called pi. You need to encode that query. Encode that query. I don't even remember offhand what the ampersand is. It's not 3D. 3D is equals 2.6. I think it's 2.6. Let's look. Um, ASCII table. ASCII table characters with HTML, octal, and hex. Wow, that's kind of tiny to read. But if you zoom in, you can find... Hex to six is ampersand. Hey, how about that? Ooh, that's a picture. What a memory. What a crazy memory for, for numbers. You need to encode that query so ampersand is turned into percent 26. Uh, on the server side, you can do this with, I don't know why they're using client script on this. GS dot, no, I can't even remember what the method was. Darn it. I've used it. <laughs> I always forget if it's URL encoder, encode URL. Code URL. Yeah, I don't like that search. URL encode. Yes? Yes? No? URL encode. Okay. That's from the API. Da, 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 da. And I thought it was part... Interesting that it doesn't say whether it's part of uh, Glide system or not in here. Does it say? Does it say Glide system? Yes. Okay, it is. I can tell because it's expanded with gs.url and code. Uh, let's take a look at that client script. I really don't think. Yeah, they could just do a get display value and an action.redirect. Using this from a UI action. So I'm going to rewrite this as var URL equals HTTP your site.com search equals plus. Uh, let's put that and then do var URL arg equals gs.url encode current dot get value reference field not value get display value current dot get current dot wow ref reference field dot get display value and action dot set redirect URL is URL plus URL arg, is that all I need to do? Is it because it's already encoded? That should do, right? I don't need to do anything else. It gets the display value, which would be apple and pi, encodes that, sticks it in URL arg, glues that together. Okay, let's try that. I recommend using this as a server side. UI action. I don't see a big need for doing this client side.
Server first, kids. Server first. All right, there's one. And you know what? I said I'd copy code over to GitHub when I'm done. So let's paste that in. Save it under today's folder. It is the 23rd. And 2018. Oh, eight. 23. This is how the sausage is made, kids. Put that in there. We'll call that uh, encoded here. UI action encoded URL.js. Save that. 2018.08.23 scripts. Commit. I know there's probably going to be more, but I just want to be able to say, all right, you can go get it now. <laughs> That was fun. Real time, just in time scripting. So you could you could pull that right off. Well, we had another reply. You need to encode the value you're trying to get. So he's done. Encode URI component. Company is get display box. So apparently there is an encode URI component that I didn't know about. Mark Stanger is participating in the community again. That's pretty freaking cool. That means he's back in the ecosystem. He was originally a ServiceNow employee until about 2012. Went off and uh, he, he's, he's the one who's behind the originator of ServiceNowGuru.com or SNCGuru.com. And he started the company CrossFuse as a consultant company. But about two years ago, he left. He retired. Don't know where he went. Don't know what he's been doing, but he's back. So good to see you. Mark back online. Uh, Chuck, one question suggestion. Is it possible for ServiceNow to facilitate ITOM slash ITAM slash PA community streams like yours? As I have watched, all of your ITOM-related videos are outdated. Yes, mostly Geneva, Helsinki, Istanbul version. So I don't know if nobody, as far as I know, nobody else is doing this in the ecosystem, doing a live stream like this. There are a number of other videos. I encourage you to look through the ServiceNow community channel on YouTube. Uh, look through the ServiceNow support. I believe it's just Now Support on YouTube. And look through the just good old ServiceNow. So there's three main channels that we have. And uh, I suspect one of those is going to have the ITOM information you're looking for. There's always something new coming out. Um, wow, Istanbul. That was a year and a half ago. So, yeah, it's time. It's time. Good evening, Makari. Ambrosia says, yay, Mark. Yes, Mark is back online. Here's another reset. Look at this. Responses are coming in as we type. So there we are. Something tells me my action set you redirect URL is going to open within the tab. So your search results will come back. Uh, the window.open with an underscore blank will open up in a new tab. So what I was curious is, and this is part of the learning process, where is that? Do we have any documentation on encode URI component? And the answer is, there's some info in the community. Encode URI computed issue in URL from new call request. Encrypt URL parameters. Hi, we have an integration between ServiceNow and BombGar. Let's see. It's this undocumented stuff that drives me nuts. Always has. Always has. <laughs> Well, apparently, two years ago, I knew about this. <laughs> Here's a solution that I made. <laughs> Yikes. Where, where do I... I don't remember that. All right, you know what I'm going to do with that? I have to take that and make a note of it because I will forget. That goes in my technical notes in Evernote, but I'm not there yet. What I'm going to do is stick it in a note here. We're all learning, or in some cases, we're relearning. And put that, let's put that down here. Okay, so I talked about the integration lessons, I talked about Stephen Bell's part four. Let's get to that other stuff in a second. That's, that's the fun stuff after we're done learning this. I just, that's insane. I think Mark's gonna get the answer on this one because they'll probably want to keep it Clyde side. Oh man, hate it when my brain quits on me. 
Oh, it's built as a JavaScript hub. So that's native JavaScript? All right, now, now you have me curious. Let's, we're, we're going to be stuck the whole hour on this one post. Let's see. So he's saying encode URI component, JavaScript, encode URI component. I must have been better at researching before. Yep, there it is. If W3Schools has it, it's native JavaScript stuff. Sure enough. Huh. <laughs> Thanks, James. <laughs> There's still a lot I don't know. Don't anybody ever say, Chuck, you know everything. Chuck doesn't know everything. Chuck hardly knows anything. I know a lot about a few things. All right, Wisdell, about you. Know, let's re refresh this. It's been uh, it's been too long. Building access hours. How to configure Qualys CMDB Sync? That's under security operations. My specialty is integrations, custom applications, and platform in general. How do we modify the UIB rating directive? That sounds like a service portal thing. Let's find out what they're talking about. I want to change the existing functionality of the rating articles currently. If a user selects the rating, it, it's directly updating. As per our requirement, if the user select a rating less than four, we want to make a comment as mandatory. Sample code. If C ratings, da 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 da. So this is service portal stuff. Why it's, and it is in the developer community. I thought it was in some, I found out that UIB rating directive is an angular term and it has a logic for updating the rating. How can we check the logic and modify it accordingly? Uh, you're calling, you need to do an ng click. I'm not seeing that anywhere. Okay, I would, I would do this with an ng click. I would do this with an ng click and write my own event handler script in the client script part of the widget. If it detects the value, did he say lower than four? I'm not sure which way they're going, but less than four. If it detects a value less than four, the client script can also make the comments field. Don't ask me how that's done. I know it can be done, but I don't know how at the moment. Mandatory. Now, they didn't say anything about how that rating is laid out. Is it radio buttons? Is it a slider? Is it a choice list? I don't know. But we don't have that information. We try to move it forward. That's how I would do it. Whether it's right or not, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, Andrew, Andrew says the same thing. I love it when I find my, the answer to my own question in the community, which is answered by me. That's happened a couple of times, and that's when I go, what, what was I drinking that day? What was I smoking? <laughs> Whatever it was, it was, my brain was working. I think it was just a matter of having a few minutes to dig in and do the research and find that answer. Um, and, and now it's, it's gone. It was, it was very transitory information. Uh, so it's, that happens. The, the lessons I learned the best are the ones that I have to dig out the solution in my own code, in my, uh, where, where you spend some time or you've made a mistake. They say you learn from your mistakes, so I must have made a lot of mistakes over the years because I've learned an awful lot. But if I'm answering a question for somebody else and I, and I you know, discover the answer and I throw it out there, it's probably not going to stick as much because I don't have an investment in that answer. So there's probably a lot of them that I've answered that just aren't sticky. Can I limit the amount of my subscribed questions showing? Where are we? Are we talking about the community? At the moment, my subscribe questions widget is making one of my pages really long for no reason. Could I limit this to show just five questions, for example? I'm not trying to limit the user to how many they can subscribe to, but I would like the widget to be able to show five subscribe questions, for example, but for the user to have to click next to view the rest. 
I have an issue where typing is very long. In in London, there is a pagination feature that I believe you can use, but I don't know if it's there. This is London. Let's see what the options are first. Let's see what the options are. This is my personal developer instance. You can get a free personal developer instance over at developer.servicenow.com. Ding. So let's go to service portal, widgets, not widget instances, and questions. Let's look for widgets that contain questions. Subscribe questions. This fortunately, it's already there out of the box. I'm not sure what's S Q S Q and A. It took me a second to figure out what that was. Subscribed questions and answers. It looks like Skanda, Squanda. Not sure what that meant. CSS, server script, client controller, link, preview, demo, data, option schema. There's no options in here. So the options are not there. You would have to write your own because it looks like Let's look at the server code real quick. I know this would be easier in the uh, editor. Server script is going to go get, uh, build an array of questions. You would have to do a limit. The pagination part might be a little tricky. Let's see if the, is it the list query? One of them has pagination built in. It's not list, it's, um, oh, I'm gonna have to think about this one. Let's keep that one handy because it's probably gonna hit me later on. How, do, how can we personalize list in ServiceNow Portal? Write your own. How can we personalize list in ServiceNow Portal? I think they're, they're talking about what columns appear and whatnot. The, uh, the short answer is you don't right now. Um, personalization, as you know it, in standard lists, with the cog. It is not available in the out of box widget for lists. Uh, if you wish, you could attempt to, you, you could copy the widget. Wow, spelling is terrific today. The widget, did I make that big again? No, the widget and Customize your own version if your Angular skills are up to par. Mm, sounds like a lot of work to me. There may be something on the share portal of the developer site. Developer. Nice. Let's put a link in there. HTTPS developer.servicenow.com. Open that in a new window. Save that. Real typing, you can hear those keys being smacked with gusto. Someone named Chuck Tomasi is about to respond to your question. <laughs> That proves Mark is streaming right now. <laughs> yeah, I know you're out there watching, buddy. <laughs> oh, man. I owe you for that one. Good thing I wasn't drinking at the same time. Oh, dear God, live broadcasting at its best right there. <laughs> True moments in community live stream. You got me. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> that was awesome. <laughs> Let's see what else we can find. All right, 25 minutes to the hour. We've got time before I go into my uh, deeper dive topic. I want to play around with some other stuff. So I like to answer a few questions. Let's, oh, there's some answers coming in the mailbox. We should probably keep those discussions going on. I was laughing so hard I probably woke up my wife. Pardon. That was too good. All right, uh, da, 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 what do we got? 
from about a year ago. <laughs> wow. Thank you, valuable information. Let's see, three months ago, it worked beautifully. Did I misread this? Okay, somebody replied to a question. Fabian, lessons learned. This is from my Todoist integration. And Fabian says, I like your solution with the event queue here, business rules and script actions. In the past project with a similar issue, I did implement an interface table instead. This way I can use an on after business rule to move the record to the interface table and then use an async rule to actually hand it over to the interface. I was thinking about something similar to the ECC queue. And I went, well, you know, we've already got, so it was, it was a, it was a toss up. There was a design discussion. I think we had this on live coding happy hour. Andrew can probably vouch for me if I can't remember anything else. We can go with that. Um, so good. Yeah, this is, it says multiple advantages. When moving data to the interface table, I can already transform the data to match the interface requirements. This allows me to have an interface script, which is reduced to take the already transformed data and just push it through the API. That's, I like that solution. Therefore, when searching for errors, I can differ between possible API issues and errors within the data transformation. Nice layer of abstraction there. Additionally, this also allows me to check the last update whenever the interface has not been doing well. Therefore, you could always manually trigger the interface from the interface table. Hmm. Kind of a, an ECCQ kind of setup. Lastly, this allows me to implement a very simple error handling structure. If I have an updated interaction, which returns an error because the record has not yet been pushed through the interface, there is a server side action to take that interface record and use the inter insert API first. I didn't quite follow that, but it sounds like awesome information. I have found this method more transparent than using events to archive the API interaction. I like it. Good info. Good info. We had considered a queue mechanism at one point, but I don't recall why I turned it down. All right, let's spell this correctly, too. Don't want to get beat up on that. Thanks for sharing. I may have to look into that at some point. Never hurts to go back and reevaluate your old design, especially when it's your code. You can do what you want with it. Gform display box reference. This is the UI action one that we were talking about. Need to encode the value you're getting. We got that. Mark, this does not work. Uh-oh. <laughs> Can you explain the requirement here? That could be because browser is unable to convert it to percent %26. We already talked about that one. Oops, looks like you've spelled Google wrong in your URL as well. <laughs> Funny. Update your script as below <laughs> to use Bing. <laughs> Should work fine. Ah, that's going to get one character, but it's not going to get all special characters. This is a suitable replacement. If you wanted to do that, you could do a standard JavaScript replace, but you're, you're only going to get those ampersands as soon as you put in another character that's special. Maybe there's a question mark in there. Um, that's going to wreak havoc as well. Maybe there's an equals in there. Not good. So those are the three common ones in a URL. There, there may be others that you want to encode. But percent question mark equals the, the ones that'll trip you up every time. So good info. I'm glad the discussion is going along well in there. Good group today. Good group, good questions. So getting back to our script yesterday, David had responded and actually got the correct answer. He had a short note on uh, just doing the add encode query. The person wanted to get the users by name. We're looking at the sys user gr member table. That's the many to many table that joins the users to the groups. Uh, if you like, go back and watch yesterday's video. I think it was towards the end where we were discussing this. And uh, he said, hey, you could just modify your query this way user dot user underscore name. So if you had Aileen dot motern or Alejandro dot mescal, those are the user IDs and not the display values. So you could get those with the encoded query, but the problem is once you know who what records are or are not in the group, you still have to put one into the group. They wanted to add these to the group. So I said, you still have to go and get a, a Glide record lookup to get it by a user ID. Uh, how to change service catalog bulk ordering more than 10? Not sure I understand the question. Something went wrong with your screen. Um, I'm watching YouTube broadcast right now. Looks. 
Is it blurry? Is it stuck? What happened to the screen? I'm not sure I understand. We still have one thing here in the inbox. Did something sneak in? Screen appears to be working. Looking at uh, the live broadcast, looking at my secondary monitor, looking at YouTube, looking at Twitch. Everything seems to be okay there. I have an unanswered thing hidden buried down here somewhere, and I don't see any blue dots that show me. I really want a button on this thing that says show unread only. I have no idea what's not read. So we'll quit with the inbox. All right, another quick topic. I had some other stuff here. I wanted to talk about this one. Let's do this one first. I know I keep pushing off that topic of many to many tables. I thought of it a couple of weeks ago and I still haven't got to it. But what I, what I saw that I thought was very fascinating is when I was going into metric base, and I don't know if I have metric base enabled on here. I do. Now that's metric definition. Metric base. You can make a metric base trigger and the metric base trigger that's not metric base, that's flow designer. Trigger definitions. I'm on it today. So look at the way this, this process flows and you'll find something interesting. When I go to, to new and say, I wanna make a band trigger, for example. Kingston has one type of trigger. Uh, London now has three. There's just a save button up here. Normally on a new form that would be submit. So how did they get rid of submit and why is there just save? Well, the reason there's just a save in here is because when you, I don't even know if I can define anything here, let's find out, dummy and table name. I don't even know if I have any tables to find. I don't, where's my other one? I'd have to go to, oh, the instance is now gone. But what happens is it comes up with an embedded list in the middle. And I said, that's great. Or what if you have a related list that you need at the end? You need the initial information. You can't show a related list. This is something that a lot of people don't understand initially. You can't show a related list on a record that hasn't been created yet because the related lists are all those records that are related to what you have created. So if it's not in the database yet, there's nothing to relate to. You need that sys ID to make the reference linkage. And that's why you don't see related lists on a new form. Case in point, if I go to incidents, case in point, better case in point, uh, I thought I had one in here, must have been my old instance. Incident, let's go to open incidents, leave that. And I click new, take a look. Here's a brand new record. It hasn't been created. It has no sys ID. Those are not related lists. Those are sections in a tab layout. There's nothing below these UI actions at the bottom. There's no task SLA. There's no incident task. There's no approvers. There's no, no related list because there's nothing to relate to. Okay, I think I made that point. However, if I wanted to do that, let me go into studio. I've got a dummy little app here called CLS for community live stream. And I have <coughs> a demo table. I gotta remember my, my data model here. I think these two are related somehow. And yes, item is related to demo. So if I go into my demo table, and let's say I wanted to, there's my items record. Let's say I wanted to create a new demo record and then ask the person, well, it's, it's easy to hit submit, but submit takes you back to the list and that's not a good user experience. So the user experience I want is let's stay on this form and get all the information we can, whether it's via embedded list or related list, we can do this. So I wanna take the submit button out. This is where it's helpful to know the sysverb underscore action names. And it's like, Chuck, what are you talking about? You suddenly went off the reservation on me. If I look at UI actions under system definition, UI actions, and I look for all of those where action name starts with sysverb underscore. I get things like delete, save, submit. A lot of those UI actions that, let me group by name, it'll look a little better because there's only a handful of them. Oh, there's several of them. <laughs> A lot of those that are out of the box, they have this special sysverb underscore prefix. And it's handy to know some of these, like sysverb underscore cancel. 
if I take a look at that and the action name is sysverb underscore cancel. I can tell you what that one does. That one's actually pretty handy. If you use a UI action name, sysverb underscore cancel, you can save without filling in all the mandatory fields. So that might be handy if you had a process like that. Now, the one that I want to get rid of is submit. And submit is down here. There's 33 different variants of submit, but they all have the same sysverb insert. All right. Now, I can get rid of that very easily on my CLS application by going like this. Some of this is experimentation. I don't know if I'm exactly on target or not here. Server development, UI action. And I can override that. I can make my own definition. Now let's call this no submit, right? On table CLS demo. And if I don't give it form button, related link, form context menu, I can really do away with this thing. Don't show it on insert. It's not going to do a thing. I don't need to give it a condition. I don't need to give it a script, but I use submit. I'll save this UI action. It now overrides the default. You know what I forgot to do? Put in sysverb insert. <laughs> it's not going to do anything unless I do that. Action names are very important when you're doing an override. I do have an article on the blog about this. So watch this. I now have a no submit. And you think, well, Chuck, isn't that just going to put up another button that says no submit right next to submit? No, because I didn't. It's oh, the action name is saying, oh, your no submit is specific to this table. And since you didn't tell me if it's supposed to be a button, if it's supposed to show up on insert, it's supposed to show up on update, I'm just going to leave it alone. So let's go back to my list of demo new record and look, no buttons. OK, so we're halfway there. That makes it somewhat fun to do. Now, what is the save button? Save button is sysverb insert and stay. There's 60 variants of that thing. Wow, that's crazy. But they all have sysverb update and stay. Let's go and make my version of that because I want another server development UI action. This is like mini lessons within the community live stream. I don't have any other place to show this stuff. <laughs> it's like, hey, there's a great idea. I want to share it. So this is, you get it. Let's call this one save on my CLS demo table. And I'm going to make that a form button. There's the action name. I don't really need a condition. I don't want it to show up. Well, maybe I do want to show up on update. Sometimes save is nice on update, sometimes not. I will make it a button which will <coughs> override. And then, of course, I can do current.update and action.set redirect. Current URL. Whew, excuse me. Getting aged. Current. I can either I can either blame my forgetfulness on my age, or I can blame it on getting up too early. How's that? I've got an excuse for everything. Even golf. Golf is the game of excuses. All right. Let's go back here to my demo record. I should now see a save button. Yay! And if I save, it'll stay on this form and show me the related list. I could also make that an embedded list quite easily. If I do configure form layout, I could just as easily take that item to demo list, put it in here on the bottom. And when you make an embedded list like that, it immediately removes the related list. So you can't have both. That's kind of a goofy place to put it just for grins. Let's fix that form layout and put an end split in there just above it so that it takes up the full width. and. Ta-da, I've got a nice new item one, item two. This is the way that I was trying to show you with the metric-based trigger definitions that you can, oh, I thought I had, huh. Oh, did I turn save? How did I define this? I have it on insert. I don't have it on update. It would be nice to have a save on update. Let's do... See, I don't have a save here anymore because my definition for insert, update, and stay only applies to new records. It said show on insert. It doesn't show 
which means it's not going to show as a button, it's not going to show as that drop down menu. That definition has now been overridden completely and it's only going to use my definition for that table. So let's do an update. It's going to jump me back to the uh, whatever it did. Demo 10,008, there's my embedded list. Now I have a save even for an updated record. And I thought, yeah, it's not going to be here because mine says, you shall be a button, which takes the context menu out. Be careful. You can only have one UI action name per form. Somebody wanted a cancel button under the context menu. Somebody wanted a cancel button on the bar. You can't have two that say sysverb underscore whatever. They would have to have two different action names. So I discovered that the hard way at a customer implementation years ago. So hopefully you found that somewhat entertaining, if not educational, about UI actions. Those sysverb underscores, get familiar with them. You don't have to memorize all, whatever it was, 30 million of them. There's... There are 47 different ones. Well, okay. Now my curiosity is peaked. Add test step. Sysverb new. Okay, maybe that's not the best thing to group by. Grouping them by name. Let's personalize the list column real quick. Add the action name in there. Move that up to some place where I can actually see it. And instead of grouping by that, let's group by action name. That might make a little more sense. That'll tell us how many action names there are. We don't necessarily need that one in the list. There are... Now my ungrouping went away. Group by action name. <laughs> 35. Wow. Sysverb cancel. Cancel and show dictionary. Cancel and show table form. Cancel and show table records. Do you, are you curious? Do you want to start digging into these and see what they are? Sysverb change password. Sysverb child new. Clone. Delete. Delete custom design. Disable debugging. That one might come in handy. Edit O2M. I know what an MTM is. I'm not sure what an O2M is. HPDT new, HP new. Okay, what is the interactive filter? HP. I'm trying to think of what HP stands for on our platform. Like PA would be performance analytics. Somebody in the chat know what HP might stand for? Don't say Hewlett Packard. <laughs> That's not what it stands for. Um. Insert and make current. That's got to be for update sets. Yep. Insert and stay. Sysverb M2MS. Glide list edit. Many too many editing of a glide list. Interesting. Oop, somehow I lost my filter. I clicked that. Ah. Uh, this is exploring time, kids. We're just having fun here. Sysverb insert, very common one that you might want to know. Insert make current, we already talked about that. Oh, we were down here. PA new, sysverb pick. If I expand that, this is all around performance analytics. Note, I think I've noted this before. Note that in most of the platform, tables are singular. And I recommend when you create new tables that you use singular names. For whatever reason, the performance analytics people did not pay attention to this best practice. And we have PA indicators, PA breakdowns, PA text keywords. Don't be like PA. Sysverb update, update, and stay. Sysverb refresh. Ooh. Ooh. That sounds intriguing. Might have to play around with Sysverb refresh. I, I suspect that's going to be, you know, this thing. Like, you can do a refresh list or a refresh form. So, click that like button if any of this is useful, stick in your back pocket. You might need it in four or five years, but uh, I, it can make a difference in how you put together your user experience when people are filling out forms. Do you need certain information on the form before you get other information? Related lists, embedded lists are a, a classic example of this. So, a lot of fun. That was, well, I, I thought it was a lot of fun. All right, let's go take one more look at the inbox. See, I can't find that one missing message. Is there anything else we need to follow up on before we head out of here? How to modify the something directive. <laughs> That's interesting. Look, 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 look. The title does not show up in this description. It somehow messed up our inbox <laughs> when you put HTML or Angular directives in there. Fun. 
Uh, even if the user selected a rating less than four, I made the comments field mandatory after selecting the rating and the user abort the action, then the selected rating value is updated. Does that mean it worked? I can't tell. I don't know. Okay, Mark Stanger's come back with... Hopefully the comedy part is over. He wins! Yay! Okay, he's got to try, try this. A two-string. Yeah, if you ever uh, start seeing wonky things, adding two-string in your JavaScript often helps. It forces the issue. Um, if you're doing server-side code and you see crazy things, I recommend get value or get display value for the server-side code, especially when you get into server's portal. Um, when you're building, say, an array, I'm making a data set that I can pass to my client script, that I can pass to my HTML, that I can iterate over and do an ng repeat. Two-string two is, is okay, but get value and get display value are really the recommended ways to do this in the server-side code. So get used to doing that. As Steve can attest to, get value, get value, get value. I think he's made even a hashtag for that. So thank you very much. Let's see, that takes care of the inbox, that takes care of my discussion. I don't think I have time to really dig into many to many tables. I'll save that as a Friday topic. Thank you for joining me. This has been a wonderful hour or so. Very entertaining. I don't think I've ever laughed as hard in the in the nine months or so. So thank, thanks to Mark Stanger for throwing that one out there about the typo and uh, answering that question. Very fun interaction today. I wish you all the best. If you learned something today, be sure to share it. Be sure to click that like button too. I know, I sound like I'm begging now. And I look forward to talking to you again tomorrow. So until then, take care. Bye.